Good evening. It's good to be with you again. Unusual to have two consecutive Sundays here, but uh, uh, hopefully that will be of benefit to us. As we start our service this evening, let's turn to Psalm 122. We were reading Psalm 130 last week, which is one of the later psalms of ascent. This is one of the earlier ones, uh, a psalm by David that would have been sung as people went to the house of the Lord to worship uh, him. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord, according to the statute given to Israel. There stand the thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. It was a duty that people had to go to worship God three times a year at Jerusalem. But this man is, is delighted that people are, are saying, let's go to Jerusalem to worship. Not everybody went. Not everybody was faithful to the Lord. But this is a man who delights to be there. He delights to be among God's people. And the picture is of Jerusalem, the people of God, uh, both in the Old Testament and effectively in the New Testament, that we are the people of God. We are Jerusalem. There the tribes go together. Tribes meet to worship God together at Jerusalem. And we've come to the house of God tonight to worship and to praise him. But notice too in verse 5, there are the thrones of judgment. Inside the city, there were the place where people met. Uh, in, a, in every town and city which was walled, they had a place where the elders of the town would meet together to give judgment and, and advice to those that came to, to seek help. And when we get to the new Jerusalem, there will be the throne of judgment, that God will be there. He will judge his people. But there too is the throne of David in Jerusalem, the place where God rules, where God's chosen uh, king ruled in the Old Testament. It was a place that reminded them that they were together, the people of God, that God had his chosen one. And we recognize Jesus as our chosen one, the one who will sit on the throne of David and rule forever and ever. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, the peace of God's people. We live in a troubled and difficult world, don't we? And we recognise from our news day by day the evil that goes on around us. We need to pray for the peace of God's people wherever they are in the world, that they may know his help and strength, his wisdom and his guidance. Pray for our families and our friends those outside of the kingdom of God, that they too may come to know the peace which passes all understanding that God gives to his people as they trust in him, that the kingdom may prosper. For the sake of the house of the Lord, I will seek your prosperity. And for us, prosperity comes with the preaching of God's word, that it may guide our lives day by day, that it may reach others, that they too may turn to the Lord Jesus for mercy and for grace. Moving on from the subject that we were thinking about last week, which was the return of the Lord, to the return of the Lord, because the return of the Lord means different things to different people. 
and tonight we are thinking about judgment. And Heather's now going to come and read to us. 2 Kings chapter 17. In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hoshea, son of Elah, became king of Israel in Samaria, and he reigned for nine years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not like the kings of Israel who preceded him. Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up to attack Hoshea, who had been Shalmaneser's vassal and had paid him tribute. But the king of, Dis um, of Assyria discovered that Hoshea was a traitor, for he had sent envoys to So, king of Egypt, and he no longer paid tribute to the king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. Therefore Shalmaneser seized him and put him in prison. The king of Assyria invaded the entire land, marched against Samaria and laid siege to it for three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. He settled them in Hala, in Gozan, on the river Habor, and in the towns of the Medes. All this took place because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of Egypt from under the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. They worshipped other gods and followed the practices of the nations that the Lord had driven out before them, as well as the practices that the kings of Israel had introduced. The Israelites secretly did things against the Lord their God that were not right. From watchtower to fortified city, they built themselves high places in all their towns. They set up sacred stones and Asherah poles on every high hill and under every spreading tree. At every high place, they burned incense, as the nations whom the Lord had driven out before them had done. They did wicked things that aroused the Lord's anger. They worshipped idols, though the Lord had said, You shall not do this. The Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and seers. Turn from your evil ways, observe my commands and decrees, in accordance with the entire law that I commanded your ancestors to obey, and that I delivered to you through my servants the prophets. But they would not listen, and were as stiff-necked as their ancestors, who did not trust in the Lord their God. They rejected his decrees and the covenant he had made with their ancestors and the statutes he had warned them to keep. They followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. They imitated the nations around them. Although the Lord had ordered them, do not do as they do. They forsook all the commands of the Lord their God and made for themselves two idols cast in the shape of calves and an Asherah pole. They bowed down to all the starry hosts, and they worshipped Baal. They sanctified their sons and daughters in the fire. They practised divination and sought omens and sold themselves to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. So the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his presence. Only the tribe of Judah was left. And even Judah did not keep the commands of the Lord their God. They followed the practices Israel had introduced. Therefore the Lord rejected all the people of Israel. He afflicted them and gave them into the hands of plunderers until he thrust them from his presence. When he tore Israel away from the house of David, they made Jeroboam son of Nebat their king. Jeroboam enticed Israel away from following the Lord and caused them to commit a great sin. 
The Israelites persisted in all the sins of Jeroboam and did not turn away from them until the Lord removed them from his presence as he had warned through all his servants, the prophets. So the people of Israel were taken from their homeland into exile in Assyria and they are still there. In Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15, we read, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the great and dreadful day of the Lord described in Joel 2. It echoes the passages that we looked at last week in Matthew 24 and refers back to Isaiah 13, which we also referenced last week as the day of judgment for Babylon. And Babylon is used in the New Testament as a picture of this present world. The day of the Lord, the day when Jesus returns as king to rule over a remade creation will be a day of contrast. As Revelation 20 reveals, it is a day of judgment. The implications of the books of record are that our sins are all known to God. We face God's judgment for what we have done. Hitler killed himself after bringing the most terrible war, war on this world. Some might think that he escaped justice. Stalin, who helped defeat Hitler, also perpetrated widespread and ruthless purges in which probably millions died. Yet he died in his bed. Did these men escape justice? The, according to the Bible, the answer is no. God rules over all things. We are not simply annihilated when we die. Instead, we face the judgment and the justice of an eternal God. The sentence delivered on Satan and on all who follow him is given there in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulphur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night, for ever and ever. Offending an eternally holy and pure God is no light thing. The consequent punishment is also eternal. Some years ago, Heather and I attended an evangelistic event at a church where we'd taken some friends to hear an evangelist speak. The evangelist clearly set out the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus as the means of our sins being forgiven. But we noticed that something was missing. A friend of ours had brought his neighbour to the event too. And afterwards, they had discussed what the evangelist had said. The non-Christian neighbour had been impressed by the talk. 
but he said he didn't think that there was anything that he needed to do. Why? The thing that was missing from the talk was judgment. Our sins have consequences. We might escape any official sanction in this world for breaking the law or the clear morality of this world's society. But there is a judge with a long memory who we have yet to face. And he has his own law too. So tonight we're going to look at this topic of judgment. It is one of the great themes that runs through the Bible. Already we have mentioned in this context Revelation, Matthew, Joel, Isaiah. The Bible is like a rope made up of many strands that run through the length of Scripture. Judgment twists and turns its work, uh, turns through the framework to add strength to the message of the eternal God. So tonight we're going to look at three things. Judgment on God's people. Judgment on God's enemies. And judgment on God's Son. So first, judgment on God's people. Recently we were watching a DVD by Don Carson at our Thursday evening Bible study. He made the point from Genesis 3 that the first doctrine of God that is denied is that of judgment. In chapter 2, verse 17, God had told Adam that he must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. But in chapter 3, verse 4, Satan says, you will not certainly die. Satan's lie helped to deceive Eve. She ate from the fruit of the tree, and Adam also ate from the tree. But when God comes to walk with Adam and Eve in the garden, he brings judgment on them for their disobedience. The denial of judgment is an illusion. Adam and Eve were God's direct creation, but God does not balk at judging his people. Although in his mercy, he gives time to repent. Earlier in the service, we read from 2 Kings 17. This passage records a summary of the destruction of Israel. The nation which was built from the descendants of God's chosen man, Abraham. Gradually, they had abandoned any trust in God. They similarly abandoned the obedience to and worship of God, or at best put it alongside the worship of the gods of the nations which God had driven out of Canaan. In so doing, they dishonoured God. They even reverted to the Canaanite practice of sacrificing their own children to the imaginary gods that had been defeated previously under the power of God. Despite the fact that they are chosen people of God, God does not spare Israel from judgment which accords with the warnings contained in their scriptures. Not only were warnings given through Moses, and you can read them in Leviticus chapter 26, you will see God had long established the terrors that would come on Israel if they, if they failed to obey God's ways. But look too at the prayer of Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 8 and God's reply in 1 Kings chapter 9. They both acknowledge the sentence that God had already proclaimed for disobedience. And God also sent his prophets to warn his people. Ezekiel 16 and 23 contain some of the most graphic descriptions of the meaning of the sins of the nation and the warnings of judgment. There is no way of getting away from God's judgment on his sinful people 
in the New Testament either. Think of the story of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. They lied to the apostles in order to gain status in the early church. Paul refers to the judgment on the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 for their abuse of the Lord's table. And the letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3 also reveal warnings to repent or suffer the consequent judgments, particularly on the churches at Ephesus and Laodicea. So throughout scripture, we come across warnings to God's people and judgment on them when they sin and do not repent. Those immediate judgments are in this life. But we've also seen in Revelation 20 that all who trust in the saving work of Jesus will escape the final punishment for their sins. And we will be returning to this later. But does that mean that we are not accountable for the way that we live our lives in the meantime? Last week, we made reference to the parable of the ten bags of gold in, um, in Matthew chapter 25. And here there is a vague reference to a difference in reward to those who serve their master diligently. This imagery stands in contrast to the parable of the workers hired to work in the master's vineyard in Matthew chapter 20. In that parable, all the workers get the same reward irrespective of the time that they have served in the vineyard. So we're not clear whether there are different eternal rewards for God's people, but it is clear from Acts chapter 5 that we cannot play fast and loose with God. We cannot continue to live in sin. And 1 John chapter 3 makes this clear. Verses 6 and 9 say, No one who lives in him, that is in the Lord Jesus, keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's sin seed remains in him. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This makes sense of the unfaithful servant in Matthew 24, 48 to, to 51 and of the five foolish virgins in Matthew 25. Apparent devotion to God is worthless if it is not accompanied by true conversion and action that confirms a new spiritual life. Second, judgment of God's enemies. If God judges his own people, will he spare those who defy him, those who are not his people? Scripture makes it clear that no one escapes judgment. The Old Testament is full of examples of God's judgment on sin. Cain bears the mark of God as part of his punishment for murdering his brother. The floods of Noah's day, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the destruction of the Canaanites are all examples designed to warn people of the ultimate judgment of eternity. The Old Testament demonstrates the way judgment comes on those who oppose God's people. In Amos 1 uh, verse 3 to 2 verse 3, God sets out the sins of the various nations that surround Judah and Israel. He sets out the punishments for those sins. In Habakkuk, the prophet laments the sins of Judah. But when God reveals that he is going to bring judgment on his people by bringing the Babylonians to punishment, punish them, Habakkuk complains that the Babylonians are evil and ungodly people. But God assures Habakkuk that even though he will use them to bring judgment on his own people, 
the Babylonians themselves will not escape their own judgment. But there is a sense in which these Old Testament judgments, while just, are only there as an illustration of the eternal consequences of their actions. See what Jesus says of the Old Testament cities destroyed by his judgments compared to New Testament sit-downs that have ignored his teaching. Matthew 11, 20 to 24. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles that had been performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. The Jews of Jesus' day had not only failed to take note of the warnings of their own scriptures, they had also failed to understand who Jesus was and to take note of the warnings that he gave them. As an aside, it is interesting to note that this pa from this passage that there also seems to be a grading of eternal judgments on those who reject God's truth. This may fit with the ideas that we noted earlier that seem to indicate differential rewards for God's people. But Romans chapter 1 gives us a striking note for the people of our day. Verses 18 to 23. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Paul goes on to speak of God removing his hand of restraint on sinners and gives them over to their own evil lusts. The passage is controversial because it highlights the type of society that we live in today. And many people, including people who claim to be Christians, want to reject the idea that their lifestyle is sinful before God. They may use such arguments as, well, society has moved on, we have changed. They ignore the fact that God claims he does not change, Malachi 3, 6, and that his word does not change, but endures forever, Matthew 24, 35. We are not judged eternally according to the changing standards of society, that would be unjust. We are judged according to the law of an unchanging God. Many in our society seek to deny that behaviour acceptable to modern society is a sin. 
the fact sinners are comfortable with sin should be no surprise to anybody. It is faithful adherence to the word of God that is a challenge to sinners. Nor is it just particular sins that bring judgment. Even if we can claim that we have not committed murder or robbery, we do not escape judgment if we have committed some other sin. And James makes this point in his letter in chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not commit murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. If we, si if we sin, we break the whole law of God, of God. We cannot pick and choose our sins. It is not our law that we are breaking. And remember that Jesus defines adultery and murder in broader terms than we, we might want to consider. Matthew 5, 21, 22. You have heard it said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to to judgment. And Matthew 5, 27 and 28. You have heard it said that you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If the world around us wants to reject God's law, it will even more want to reject such an interpretation and understanding of what the law really means. Let me just make this point. We are not accountable for the law, for what God's law says. It is not our law that people are rejecting. It is God's law. People are not accountable to us. They are accountable to God. We, as God's people, are not accountable for God's law, but we are accountable for the way that we live according to God's law. And we are accountable to God for the way that we proclaim it. If people have trouble with God's law, direct them to the author. Don't try to defend it yourself. God will defend his own honour. And that brings us briefly to our third point, judgment on God's Son. I say briefly, not because it's a least important point, indeed it is the most important point, but because it's simple and straightforward. God is an angry God, a jealous God. God is a God of love, yes, but he is also a God of righteousness, purity, holiness, and justice. He has given his creation laws to live by because they grant an ordered and blessed life. So any infringement of God's law mars the good world that God has created for his creatures. We cannot expect God to be happy with us if we pray, break his gracious and wise laws. As we've seen, God is a God of justice who judges mankind according to his own wise counsels. But the Bible teaches and reminds us that all mankind are sinners. In Romans 3, Paul sets out a whole string of Old Testament verses that set out how sinful mankind is before reaching his conclusion in verse 23. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. On this basis, no one is ever worthy of receiving God's ple good pleasure. But God is also a merciful and gracious God. 
If God judged all mankind according to their sins, none of us could stand before him. Last week, we read from Psalm 130, which reminds us, If you, Lord, kept a record of our sins, who could stand? And the Bible says sinners are spiritually dead. Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of air, of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. We deserve the sort of judgments that we have seen as we have looked at scripture this evening, both temporal and eternal judgments. But Paul, speaking to the Ephesians, continues in chapter uh, 2, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So how does God bring us forgiveness without overturning his own justice and righteousness? It is by pouring out his wrath on his own son, the Lord Jesus. Only God could compare, only God could bear the wrath of God and survive. Jesus has borne the judgment for our sins if we have trusted in him. John the Baptist described Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, John 1, 29. The Jews would have been familiar with the idea of a substitutionary sacrifice. It was the basis of their whole sacrificial system. The sinner brought the sacrifice to the temple and laid his hands on it to symbolise the transfer of their sins before the animal was sacrificed. It pointed towards the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus for our sins. But as I highlighted earlier, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross does not mean anything to us unless we recognise that uh, and we claim it for ourselves. We pay, face the punishment for our sins. It is not the case that Jesus' sacrifice is automatically and indiscriminately applied to all. We have already seen that we all face judgment. Revelation 20 reminds us that it is only those whose names are written in the God's book of life who escape eternal damnation and are not assigned a place in the lake of eternal fire with Satan. We have to repent and believe in the saving work of Jesus on the cross. In his important sermon to the Jews at Pentecost, Peter says this, Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing, nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. <clears throat> 
those who heard Peter or had their conscience pricked. Acts 2 goes on. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter's reply is interesting. Peter replied, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Salvation comes to all who repent and believe. Who will do that? Luke here says that it's those whom God calls. We've already seen that by our human nature, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. By our human nature, we could not respond to the call of God. It is God who calls. In Acts 17, Paul is speaking to the people of Athens and says, God commands all people everywhere to repent. But Luke goes on to describe how some wanted to know more about this, but others sneered. They weren't interested. Peter, in 2 Peter 3, says something that links with the return of the Lord Jesus that we were thinking about last week. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has, been, as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world at that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the, the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to the new heaven and the new earth where righteousness dwells. So in conclusion, the Bible clearly shows we all face the judgment of Almighty God. Whether there are different differential rewards and punishments is unclear. But what is clear is that God's people will escape the final judgment of wrath. They are claimed by Christ Jesus as his own to live forever with him in glory. But those who have not sought the mercy of God through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Eternal punishment is delivered. This is not a pleasant thought. We might well want to view our sins as less deserving. But it is God who is the judge. Only the eternal judge decides our final sentence. 
If you have not done so already, you need to seek his mercy now. If salvation is already yours, you have a duty to proclaim these truths to others that they too might seek God's mercy. Be faithful to the call that you have been given. Thank you.